So Galatians 3, 15 to 29, page 1237 in the Pew Bible. So this is God's word for us today. The law and the promise. To give a human example, brothers, even with a man-made covenant, no one annuls it or adds to it once it has been ratified. Now the promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring. It does not say, and to offsprings, referring to many, but referring to one, and to your offspring, who is Christ. This is what I mean. The law, which came 430 years afterwards, does not annul a covenant previously ratified by God so as to make the promise void. For if the inheritance comes by the law, it no longer comes by promise, but God gave it to Abraham by a promise. Why then the law? It was added because of transgressions until the offspring should come to whom, he, whom the promise had been made, and it was put in place through angels by an intermediary. Now an intermediary implies more than one, but God is one. Is the law then contrary to the promises of God? Certainly not. For if a law had been given that could give life, then righteousness would indeed be by the law. But the scripture imprisoned everything under sin so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. Now before faith came, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. So then, so then the law was our guardian until Christ came in order that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. For in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to promise. Praise God for his word. You may be seated. Well, this is Father's Day. Welcome and uh, salute to fathers here, as well as fathers that we remember. I um, was thinking about my father as we approached this day. My birthday was Friday, June 17th. For those of you who don't know, remember it as Watergate break-in day. So that's, that's my claim to fame uh, in that regard. But... Father's Day and my birthday came on the same day uh, on occasion. And so I was looking that up, and I don't know why the web was hard to find. But there were seven occasions between the time of my birth and my father's death where Father's Day and my birthday, June 17th, happened on the same day. And I can remember I was so excited to be able to share that day with my dad because my dad and I had the same special day. Well, my dad has been gone uh, just 30 years now. Uh, last month. Um, he, he was a farmer in western Pennsylvania, and I grew up on that farm and moved away um, longer than I want to remember now, 60 years ago at least. But uh, that was his community where he lived. And so a year after my dad died, I went back to see the stone that had been purchased and placed on his gravesite. And my uncle, who was two years my dad's elder, but never married a bachelor in the community his entire life, he and I walked back through the cemetery to see my dad's grave. And as we did, he was commenting on the various headstones and families that were there. And he remarked to me just sort of offhand, you know, there was a time when every family up and down this valley was either a Stuart or married to a Stuart or somehow connected to the Stuarts. That was a name that meant something in that community uh, where my father was buried and where he had lived much of his life. To be Herb Stuart's boy was a position of honor and a position of obligation in that community. Uh, your father had a place, and you as his child came in that place. 
not that you had done anything, and hopefully you didn't do anything to dishonor the name, but because you were Herb Stewart's boy, you know, they knew where you belonged, and they, you knew what was expected of you. Well, I, I just share that with you today as we begin to this passage in Galatians, because I want to say that, that knowing our identity, knowing whose child we are, as children of God, is absolutely vital to our stability as Christians, to, to our maturing or our maturity as believers, and ultimately to our fruitfulness as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so as we look at this passage, a little background, it's, it's uncertainty perhaps about their identity in Christ that, that leads Paul to write this letter to the Galatians. He has come there, he's shared the gospel, the church has been formed, he has gone on on his missionary journeys, and, and now he hears concerns about their spiritual condition. Uh, really from the beginning of the letter, he writes in, in verses 6 and 7 uh, at the beginning, chapter 1, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Paul, Paul is both appealing to the church and rebuking them for seemingly forgotten whose child they are, whose, whose family they belong to. And as he begins this chapter 3, we break into reading halfway through the chapter, he says, O oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? What's happened? What what has led you to forget or, or to ignore or, or to be ignorant of? Whether it's a lack of understanding, uh, a lack of commitment perhaps, or, or simply falling prey to deceivers, Paul is determined that he's going to ground the Galatians in their identity in Christ so that they can be fruitful in their faith. And so as... as he writes this letter, we come to this passage, uh, I, I thought of Paul as schooling the Galatians. He's going he's to take them to school to ground them in their identity in Christ so that they can be fruitful. So if you've got the insert and want to follow along, a little rapid review of history, a concise course in theology, a little lesson on law, and then a succinct summary of sonship. We get excited about this sort of thing, preachers do, so you'll have to bear with me today, all right? A rapid review of history. Paul begins there in verse 15. To give a human example, brothers, even with a man-made, and set that word covenant aside for a moment, because I think the usage here is better of a will. In the case of a will, no one annuls it or adds to it once it's been ratified. Now, you know, you can write a new will or have a codicil, in, in addition to the original will, but, but no one else has the right to change your will. And now the promises, he said, were made to Abraham and to his offspring. The, the covenant promises were made not to offsprings, but to offspring Christ. So he has gone back 2,000 years from his point to Abraham, who we read about in Genesis chapter 12, God made a promise to that he was going to bring forth from Abraham's own flesh, from him and Sarah, a seed. Paul makes the point again, not seeds. Now, they had Isaac, but that didn't exhaust it. The seed was going to extend throughout history. The promise to Abraham was he would have a family, he would have many descendants, he would have a land, and that through him, all the nations of the earth would be blessed. That was the promise that came some 2,000 years before. And so he says, look, the law, verse 17, the law which came 430 years afterwards. Now, not 430 years after Abraham, but Abraham has Isaac. Isaac doesn't enter into the promise. He doesn't live in the land of of promise. And then you have Jacob. He doesn't live in the land of promise. And the 12 original sons of Jacob all die in exile. None of them inherit the promise of the land per se. But, but the Jews, the Israelites spend 430 years as slaves in Egypt. And at the end of that time, at the end of that 430 years, Moses leads them out and under Moses, then, they are given the law. So that's what he's saying. Abraham has the promise 2,000 years ago. 
Fast forward Isaac, Jacob, all of the brothers, and now finally, after 430 years in slavery, the promise last being renewed with Jacob, God leads the Israelites out and gives them the law. So, that law coming 430 years later cannot set aside the will or the covenant that God had made with Abraham. And then he, of course, goes through to say, verse 16, to your offspring who is Christ. Christ has come. This is the gospel that he has preached. So 2,000 years prior, Abraham, 430 years in slavery, the law to Moses, and now the offspring to whom the promise is made, Jesus Christ, has come. And he says that the covenant comes by a promise so that... The Gentiles, too, might receive, verse 14, Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham, might come to the Gentiles as well so that we might receive the promise of the Spirit or the promised Spirit through faith. So that's the rapid review of history from from 2,000 years prior right up to the gospel that Paul has preached. This is the way it is, Galatians. Promise first, law second. All right? Now, a little concise course in theology. What's the difference between the two? Well, God dealt with Abraham according to one principle and with Moses by a different one. One by promise, one by law. In in the promise to Abraham, if you're familiar with that passage in in Genesis, Abraham's concerned. I don't have any children, Lord. How am I to trust you for this promise? And God has a deep sleep fall on Abraham after Abraham is set sacrificial animals in place. A deep sleep falls upon Abraham and God himself walks down through between the carcasses of the sacrifices that Abraham had prepared. And in that time and culture, that meant that that those who made the covenant walked between the halves of the sacrifices in essence saying, look, if I don't keep this covenant, may what happened to them happen to me. The important thing to notice, of course, is that it is only God who walks between the halves of the carcasses. In essence, saying, I will uphold this covenant. I will. I will give you an offspring. I will give you a land. I will give you a posterity. I will make of you a blessing to all the nations. So in in promise to Abraham, it's all God. I will, I will, I will. It's God's plan, it's God's grace, it's God's initiative, it's God's act. But the law, he says, that didn't come that way. The law came through an intermediary, Moses, he doesn't name him, but intermediary. It was put in place through angels. And what does the law say? You shall, you shall not. You shall, you shall not. It's a completely different principle. The promise is of God... The law is man's responsibility. God's grace only has to be believed to be accepted. You, you, you believe God as Abraham did, it says, and it was accounted to him as righteousness. But in the law, you had to keep the law. Those who keep the law shall live by it. But he says, if an inheritance came by works or by the law, then the promise would be void, verse 17. But it doesn't come, excuse me, if inheritance comes by the law, verse 18, it no longer comes by promise, but God gave it to Abraham by a promise. If you look back, if you have your Bibles, look back at the last verse of chapter 2, 221. Paul says, I don't nullify the grace of God in preaching the gospel. For if righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. So here's the theology. It is God's promise to Abraham, God's giving of the law to Moses. John Stott in his commentary, the message of Galatians, only one way, writes this. God's promise was free and unconditional, no strings attached. There were no works to do, no laws to obey, no merit to establish, no conditions to fulfill. 
God simply said, I will give you a seed. To your seed, I will give the land. And in your seed, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. His promise was like a will, freely given the inheritance to a future generation. And like a human will, this divine promise is unalterable. It is still in force today, for it has never been rescinded. You grasp the promise? Just a quick side note here. I became a believer in Labrie Fellowship in 1976. And Kathy and I were in England. And I came to the Lord the week before Easter. And one of the first books I read was this commentary by John Stott on the book of Galatians. The message of Galatians, only one way. I still have the copy. It's written 85 pence on the cover. That's how old that book is. But the point is, what an incredible gift to a new believer to have the message of Galatians and and the promise of Jesus Christ so clearly explained to be able to ground me in, in that identity in Jesus. I'm so grateful to the Lord for that provision and to uh, Dr. Stott for this book that he wrote. But, but it was there at the beginning of my Christian life, and I'm, I'm eternally grateful for that. But, but that was a concise course in theology for me, Stott's commentary. And, and Paul's little concise course in theology here is the difference between law and promise. If it came by law, then Christ died to no purpose, and righteousness would come by the law. But, he says... That's not the kind of law that we got. The law that we have doesn't bring righteousness. What we have is the promise of God. If it came by inheritance, it wouldn't be by promise. But, 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 God gave it to Abraham by a promise. So here's a little lesson on the law then. Paul asked, why then the law? You could almost imagine him in in conversation with opponents or those who have misled the Galatians. Why the law, Paul says, It was added because of transgressions. Until the offspring, that is one, should come to whom the promise has been made and it was put in place. Okay, why? The the function of the law wasn't to give salvation. That was God's promise, freely of him. The function of the law was to convince men of their need of salvation. What have I done wrong? Paul says, You know, if the law hadn't said, do not covet, I wouldn't have known what coveting was. I mean, I'd been doing it all along, but it didn't have a label, i.e., sin. I just, that's what I did. And then the law came, and I thought, oh, no, I'm a dead man, because I've broken that law. And that's what the law is intended to do. Why? To tell us that we have rebelled against God's rightful authority. We are not obedient children. We are rebels against the authority of the creator, the sovereign God of all creation, all of life. We are in rebellion against him. Verse 22, we are all under sin. The scripture imprisoned everything under sin. Why? Because we were all under the law held until the coming faith would be revealed. Verse 10, if you go back, look at that. All who rely on works of the law are under curse, for it is written, cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of law. So the law came to teach us that we needed salvation. The law came to show us that we were in rebellion against God, that we were cursed under that. And Paul likens it to two different things here. He says in verse 23, now before faith came, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until faith would be revealed. That is, we we were in the jailhouse. We couldn't get out. We we were locked up under law. And in every attempt that we made to, you might say, break free, resulted in us just encountering the fact that we wanted to break free of God. We were held captive. But he says also the law was our guardian. Verse 24, that's not an essentially, or that's not really a good translation word. The, the word in Greek is pedagogue, from which we get pedagogy. It, it was typically a slave whose responsibility it was to oversee the child, and not like a you know, headmaster in a school or, or, or not a guardian. The 
pedagogue or pedagogus was typically illustrated by a slave holding a staff. The slave's job was to whip the child in the line. And they were often cruel. There are accounts, you know, in, in the ancient Greek and Roman world of, of pedagogues who, who were cruel to their charges. Why? Because it was their responsibility to make sure the child behaved. So the law was both like a jailer keeping us in prison, confronting us with the reality that we were rebel, rebels against God, and it also was a pedagogue. Yeah, we were supposed to learn things, but you learn through the rod. And Paul says the law was these two things. And why was it there? Verse 19, it was added until the offspring should come to whom the promise had been made. That is, until Jesus came. Through Abraham's seed, back to the history lesson, the law was there until that seed came. Now, faith here has a couple different nuances. I want to just make sure you're aware of that. Before faith came, verse 23, we were held captive under the law. That, that is a historical reality, if you will. So the, the Jewish people being given the law under Moses uh, after the exile in the wilderness, they come into the land, they settle it. Um, as the nation of Israel grows, the law is always there. The nation is judged and thrown into exile under the Babylonians because they broke the law. And, and the writers of Chronicles and of kings are, are clear to point that out. Why did Israel end up exiles and slaves? Because you broke the law of God. So historically, the law was there all of these years until Jesus came, the one who was born of the virgin in due time, in the proper time, the scripture says. So historically, law was there until Jesus came, and that's the faith, okay? You might say the, the faith once for all delivered to the saints. But on a personal level, each one of us each and every one of us has, if you will, that same history. We were, by nature, children of wrath. Then the law comes and instructs us how it is that we need salvation, why it is that we need Jesus. I know I've shared this before, but I, I remember when I was in seminary talking to somebody in our <coughs> apartment complex, Asked him the question, you know, if you, were, if you were to die and go to heaven and God said, why should I let you in here, what would you say to him? And his answer was, why would he want to keep me out? No cognizance of his position as a sinner before a holy God. Well, you, you don't get to Jesus before you get to Moses, neither historically or individually. No one flees to Jesus if they think, well, God's not, nothing against me. I'm good. No, you're not good. You need to find that out, how bad you are, so that the goodness of Christ can be seen and embraced and rejoiced in. So in, until faith comes, not just historically, the coming of the offspring, but until faith comes individually, we are held under the law, condemned as sinners, lost as members of a corrupt, rebellious race. And then faith comes now in, in this sense of the word it's an existential you might say intellectual soulful experience i came from the condemnation of the law to see my need of christ and at the foot of the cross i bowed down and acknowledged him as lord that his sacrifice there was the payment for my sins he became a curse and redeemed us from the curse says Paul back in verse 13. In Christ Jesus, then, verse 14, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles, people who didn't have the history of Abraham, the history of the exile, the history of the law. Even those who didn't have that can have the promise of God because the promise is made to Christ, the offspring, and in him, the Gentiles, too, might receive the promise of God the Spirit. So the work of the law was temporary, historically. It was, if you will, subsumed, fulfilled in Jesus and his death upon the cross. But, but it also is an existential work. 
In each of our lives, the work of the law continues until we come to the point of seeing the promise of God in the person of Jesus Christ and acknowledge that in him is our salvation. The law shuts us up in the prison until Jesus sets us free. The law puts us under cruel and harsh taskmasters until Christ makes us his sons. So, from this rapid review of history and this concise course in theology, this little lesson on the law, Paul moves on then to a succinct summary of what does it mean to be a son? Verse 24, so then the law was our guardian until Christ came in order that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian, but in Christ Jesus you are all sons of God through faith. That's the first aspect of, of sonship. All in Christ and only those in Christ are sons of God. By faith in him, we are brought into the family of God. We are made new creations. Paul says as much earlier. If anyone is in Christ, new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. So, what does it mean to be a son? That means that we are in Christ, not in ourselves. No one enters into the promise of God on the basis of anything about themselves. We only enter into the, the promise of God, into the welcome of his family through faith in Jesus because it is Jesus, the offspring, the single seed promised to Abraham. It is in him that the promise is received. Through him, the promise is extended. And, and it is by him then that all the nations of the world, as God had promised Abraham, all the nations of the world might be blessed. So what does it mean to be a son? It means to be united in Christ as a son of God. Secondly, he says, for as many of you were baptized into Christ, you put on Christ. So, well, Paul certainly isn't changing his theology here to, to point to baptism as giving us Christ. He is saying that as we are baptized into Christ, and he uses that language, as we are baptized, we make public acknowledgement of the faith that both historically came about in Jesus and the faith existentially which has now led us to salvation in Christ. So as many as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There are some commentators who suggest that this phrase put on refers to a robe that a Roman son would now don as he went from the guardianship of the pedagogue into the full exercise of his right as a son of the father. So, so Paul may be saying just the same way that you see Roman boys you know, entering into their maturity, putting on this robe, Jesus Christ is your robe of maturity. That's how you enter into full sonship of the Father. But notice there's, a, there's another blessing here. There's neither Jew nor Greek, two huge significant divisions in mankind. There's neither slave nor free. Again, in the Roman society, the predominant, the majority of citizens in ancient Rome were slaves. They weren't citizens, of course, but the majority of the population were slaves. And there's no male or female. There's, there's no 50-50 slice. That all of those distinctions that we would use to, you know, put ourselves one against the other are gone in Christ. We are all one in Jesus. Now, Paul is not saying that Christians are blind and don't see colors that, you know, uh, unlike some Supreme Court nominees, we do understand what a woman is and therefore what a man is. Those things are pretty evident. It's not that they don't exist. They do. But they don't matter. They don't matter. Those ancient distinctions often used to oppress or at least to disdain are gone in Christ Jesus. We are equals. We are brothers and sisters in Christ through the promise to Abraham brought to reality in Jesus. And, he says in verse 29, if you are Christ's, if you belong to him, then, he sort of wraps it all up again, back to Abraham, you are Abraham's offspring. You are the one, not the many, we just got rid of the many in the verse before, you are the one that God promised Abraham he would bring forth. 
That one is Jesus Christ, and you and him are his. You are, you are inheritors of the promise, heirs of the promise in Christ. So we're, we're no longer, you know, lost in the cosmos. We're no longer adrift in history or an outsider or a misfit. We, we are in Christ, an heir of Abraham in the family of of God according to promise. So let me make just a little application today. We're, we're done with our lesson. Paul has hopefully churched us, the, or schooled us, the way he has the Galatians. Meaninglessness, hopelessness, lack of purpose is a significant, I'll call it ailment for lack of a better word, in our culture today. We can point to a lot of reasons perhaps, and, and COVID might be one of them, but the point is, we are alienated, not only from one another, and not only from God, but alienated from ourselves in the main. The old rock song, All We Are Is Dust in the Wind, is for far too many people an existential reality, a psychological reality. It's how they see themselves and they see the world in which they live, and they don't feel like they belong, and, and in that sense, nobody does. So they are without an anchor. They're nobody's kid. I had the incredible luxury of being Herb Stewart's boy in a community where that had meaning. There was a significant reputation attached to being Herb Stewart's boy. But for the world around us, there is no connection. They are no child. They belong to nobody with no hope and no purpose and no promise. And into that dark reality, psychological, emotional, spiritual reality, comes the, the light of the gospel, comes the truth of Jesus Christ, that in him, we are somebody. We are children of God. We are brothers and sisters together. We, we are at home in the cosmos now because our Father made this for us. And we live as his children here, unlike the Gentile world, which, which Paul speaks of in Ephesians as being without hope and without God in the world. So, so those unattached, those drifting in the wind, are now solidly rooted in Jesus Christ. Those, those who had no purpose now have the purpose of relating to God. They, they belong in eternity, if you will. They they can relate to one another, to brothers and sisters, no matter of class distinctions or sexual distinctions or racial or income distinctions. It doesn't matter. We can connect with one another as brothers and sisters. And, and then we have a place in history. And we're not just for today. We're not just for today. We are made for eternity and we are promised an inheritance that's being kept for us in heaven. But at the same time, now we have roots, roots we didn't know we had. Roots that go back for us 2,000 years to Jesus and from Jesus 2,000 years back to Abraham and from Abraham how many thousand years back to Adam and Eve whom God made in his image and blessed. We belong in that history. It is after all his story, capital H. It is God's story that we are now a part of. And so I want to rejoice in that with you this Father's Day. Paul says, if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to promise. Praise God that we have a real, true, dynamic answer to the question, whose child are you? Let's pray together. Lord, we rejoice in the goodness that has come to us while we were yet sinners. Christ died for us. And so we are told that he who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? And so we have been given the promises of God, promises that are true and real and good and perfect. And so we rest in those promises even as we work out our salvation with fear and trembling. But we do so as your children, brothers and sisters together, as children of the Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ our Lord, in whom we pray.
Amen.